We had a really interesting talk tonight. Uh, the class is on genetic genealogy. It's given by Dr. Patrick Walden. Uh, Patrick is a mathematician and uh, a very enthusiastic genetic genealogist. Um, I'm going to hand you across to him. Uh, he'll give you um, a really good, a really good outline of how to how to start um, using genetics and DNA testing um, to power challenge your family history research. And I don't see things that scratch those out as well. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I have put together some notes. I probably won't get through everything on this. So all you really need to write down is the address pwaldron.info forward slash uppercase tcd forward slash lowercase beginners forward slash 2020. And you can follow all the links. If you have a device with you, you can even follow them along as you listen to me. I am recording it. I will hopefully get around to putting it up on YouTube at some stage. I have some DNA kits from Family Tree DNA with me. If anyone is convinced by the end of this session that they should swap for Family Tree DNA, you can talk to me afterwards. Um, so the outline of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to put genetic genealogy hopefully in the context of what Fiona tells me she has been teaching you for the last number of weeks. Then I'm going to run over the definitions of the various components of DNA that we can use for genealogy, the different inheritance paths of those components, how DNA changes from generation to generation by mutation and recombination. Then I will go through some of the DNA websites, of which there are many, and show you some of the features you should be using. And then I will go through a very interesting case study, if I have time at the end, to show you how genetic genealogy can break through a family secret or a family mystery that persisted for, in this particular case, 119 years. You're the expert in your family history. You've listened to it as you've grown up. You have family papers may be in your attic or in a biscuit box or somewhere. And you have the family DNA in every cell in your body, which is just as valuable to you as the oral tradition and the family papers. And your task is to compile the family history by trying to reconcile those three types of private information, the oral, the genetic, and the paper, with the public records that Fiona has just been talking about, and with each other. And sometimes they make sense, and sometimes you scratch your head for a while, and eventually they will always make sense. So what is genetic genealogy? I looked in Wikipedia, and I don't really like the definition. And Fiona used the phrase testing as well. It says the use of DNA testing in combination with traditional genealogical methods to infer relationships between individuals and to find ancestors. But testing is really what it's all about. But sending your DNA off to the DNA companies is not testing. You've got to study the results when they come back. And you have to come up with a hypothesis about your family history that you're not sure about, but that you think DNA evidence will help you to resolve. So I thought I would start by showing you the real DNA testing website. It's called WHATO, or What Are the Odds? This is a family tree. This is connected with the case study at the end. I put it together just with the first names for privacy reasons. Um, there was a man called Michael who lived several generations ago. There was a man called Eugene who lived more recently. And we want to figure out how was Eugene descended from Michael. At the stage where I put this chart together, I was happy that Eugene was a grandson of Michael. Michael had half a dozen children, and Eugene could have been the son of any of the known children or of the unknown child, which I'm just calling fifth son. There's a daughter and four sons that we know about, there could be a fifth son that we don't know about. So each of these six hypotheses here is the possible place for Eugene's grandchild, the person whose DNA we have in the family tree. Eugene is long dead. Um, we don't have his DNA. His children are dead. We don't have their DNA. We have the grandchildren's DNA. In fact, we have DNA from eight grandchildren. So I could have done this with numbers from any of eight individuals. We also have DNA from all these people in white who are known descendants of Michael. And if we fill in on the pedigree how much DNA in units called centimorgans 
each of the known descendants shares with this gentleman who, or lady, I think, Pat is, is her name, whose DNA we've used. The system will tell us where are the possible places that Pat and her grandfather, Eugene, could fit in this family tree. And the idea is to get the biggest possible score. There are two of the possibilities that score a zero, uh, because there's just not enough DNA shared by Pat here with Mary here for them to be second cousins as shown on the chart. And we can rule out hypothesis five here. Pat is not descended from Thomas because she doesn't share enough DNA with Catherine or Claire. She probably does share enough with Irene. But the others are possible. Um, Mary at the top is the least likely, a score of one. Um, Daniel is 19 times more likely than Mary to be Eugene's parent. Patrick is 30 times more likely than Mary to be Eugene's parent. But some unknown fifth child is 255 times more likely to be Eugene's parent. So with this evidence from one of Eugene's grandchildren, we say that it is most likely we're looking for a fifth son of the original Michael that we haven't yet identified in the records. Problem is we have eight grandchildren of Eugene and they're all going to give us different results. We'll come back to that at the end, but that is real statistical hypothesis testing based on DNA. That's the sort of question DNA can answer for you. Uh, I recommend to everybody, when you're doing your family tree, put it into genealogy database software. I use Ancestral Quest. It may not be the best. I've used it for over 30 years now. Um, I don't want to change at this stage. There is my pedigree chart in Ancestral Quest. You need to link that information to your DNA information on the DNA comparison websites, which I will show you later, in order to enable you and your DNA matches to work out how you might be related to each other. I have mine on the web as well. You can use that sort of software to generate the book on the family history automatically, or you can use it as a guide if you're writing a book on the family history. Um, you can put any sort of narrative information in the notes in the database, as well as the names, dates, and places that fit into the, the pre-programmed fields. We have used, or you have used, genealogical records left behind by your ancestors in paper form. This present generation is the first generation that is leaving behind deliberately records of its DNA for our descendants. The more of us put our DNA in the DNA databases, the more valuable they will be, the more useful they will be to us. And luckily, there are an awful lot of people who have done that already. Here is a recent chart showing in millions the number of people who are customers of the big DNA comparison companies. Ancestry DNA in green is the biggest. It now has over 16 million people in its database. The next biggest is 23andMe, which has over 10 million in its database. My heritage is not as old as the others. It has 3.77 million in its database. And then the smaller ones are Family Tree DNA, which um, isn't in direct competition because it's more interested in Y-DNA analysis, which I'll come to in a minute, and JetMatch, which does not actually take DNA samples. It takes data files from the other DNA companies and analyzes them. We would all love to have our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents' DNA. There is technology evolving which allows DNA to be extracted from artifacts like stamps or letters that your ancestor might have leaked, or hairbrushes or toothbrushes or something that they might have left behind, but they're not really commercially available yet. And if you think how valuable your grandparents' and great-grandparents' DNA would be to you, think of your descendants if you have any or intend to have any, and realize they, in a hundred years' time, when the technology has moved on again, will be eternally grateful that you've left your DNA for analysis. So do unto your descendants as you wish your ancestors had done unto you. And if you have living parents or grandparents, make sure you get their DNA before it's too late, because you have only half of each parent's DNA and a quarter of each grandparent's DNA. Um, and you want to see the other half as well. 
So deciding not to use your DNA in this day and age in genealogy is the equivalent of deciding you're not going to use census returns because you don't believe in statisticians having access to your private information. Everyone has to use it. But there are caveats. DNA has left the genie out of the bottle, so to speak, as regards family secrets, adoptions, fosterings, bigamy, runaway ancestors, whatever. We'll come to those in the case study later on. If you want your family secrets to stay secret, not only do you have to keep your own DNA out of the databases, but you have to keep the DNA of all your other immediate family members out of the databases, and you have to keep the DNA of future generations of the family out of the databases after you've gone. So you've got to be prepared. If there is a family secret, it will come out and treat the people involved sympathetically and sensitively. And, um, get them to talk to social workers or whoever is expert on such things if, if it is emotionally difficult for them. So that's just the one disadvantage that it may have. Um, some people want their se family secrets to stay secret for hundreds of years. But I think we're in a society now where things that were covered up in the past are not being covered up anymore, and things that were a source of shame in the past are not a source of shame anymore. So I'm going to try and the 35 minutes or so left to me to teach you methods that you can use to get the most out of this new source, your DNA information. And the objective is to try and get you to interrogate and extract relevant evidence from the DNA like you would from any other source, and to um, find hints in the DNA that might send you off looking in other sources, and vice versa, you might find hints in the paper sources that raise ideas in your mind, and you might go to the DNA to see um, could that theory be correct? So like that pedigree chart I showed you earlier, um, we figured out from DNA that Eugene was Michael's grandson, and then we went off looking at paper records to see what sons Michael had who might be Eugene's grandfather, and back and forth between the DNA records, the paper records, and the oral history all the time. And you will meet a lot of people through using DNA. You we're all part of genetic communities. The DNA companies market heavily what are really just estimated ethnicity percentages. They don't tell you the margin of error around those percentages. They don't tell you exactly what the ethnicity means. Um, what does it mean to be Irish? What does it mean to be German? What does it mean to be Swiss? Um, so I've no, I've no real time for that. I'm not interested in DNA for that. You will get that as a free add-on to the genealogical information that you get. But it is the case that people whose ancestors were close geographically tend to be close genetically. If you think of a small rural Irish parish where nobody married anyone who lived more than five or 10 miles away, everyone is going to be closely related and they're going to share DNA. In West Clare, where my ancestors came from, we just say, ah, he matches all the usual suspects. All the neighbors are fourth or fifth or sixth cousins to each other. I actually figured out at one stage there's probably about a 95% chance that any two Irish people with deep Irish roots are 12th cousins or closer. And if you bring that down to a smaller area, the relationship gets closer again. The other sort of communities you get involved in with DNA are the research communities, family tree DNAs. In terms of the number of customers, one of the smaller DNA comparison companies, but it hosts wonderful DNA projects or groups, as they call them. Some of them are geographically based. You can join a group for people from your county or even from a smaller area. I'm the co-administrator of the Clare Roots Project. Each of these projects has its own website. We now have 1,435 people with ancestry on some side of the family from Clare who have joined this project. And there are lots of facilities on that project website to help them to get to know each other, find out how they're related to each other, uh, do additional research. I haven't time to go through all of that today. There are also surname projects uh, for many surnames, thousands and thousands of surnames, family tree DNA. I administer a number of them. I'll show you the Durkin one later on. And when you get your DNA results back, um, you can join haplogroup projects. A haplogroup is just a big word, meaning a group of people with similar DNA. 
So you might not know how you're related to these people, but you have similar DNA to them. You join the same project or group with them and uh, hopefully work out exactly what the relationship is. I should have asked at the beginning, I usually do, is there anyone in this room who has not yet sent their DNA off for analysis? About half of you. Hopefully by the end of this class you'll be convinced to do it. So what is DNA? You really only need to know the answer to this question for a pub quiz. You don't need to know it for genealogy. It's short for deoxyribonucleic acid. And it's made up of four chemical molecules, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thionine. Again, you only need to know those for pub quizzes. All you need to know is that when you spit or swab your cheek and send off your DNA sample to the lab, what you get back is a computer file containing large numbers of the letters A, C, G, and T, representing these four molecules that make up your DNA. So this is part of the first chromosome. These are identifiers that are used to um, work out what the gene actually does. These are the actual position in sequence on the chromosome. They're in order. And sometimes the machine can't actually read at the location. But in general, it's supposed to read two letters. One letter comes from your father, one from your mother. In most of these cases, the letter from both sides is the same. Here's an AG, uh, where one parent had an A, the other parent had a G. Unfortunately, the technology cannot yet tell whether the A came from the father and the G from the mother, or vice versa. It would make life a lot easier um, if it did. So you actually end up sometimes getting false matches or half identical by chance matches uh, because of wrong inference and trying to separate the paternal and maternal sides of it. So if you have a big DNA match, there's no doubt about it. The small ones sometimes, because of the problem of not being able to separate the paternal and maternal may be leading you the wrong direction. You can download those large files from the website of whichever laboratory has analyzed your spit or your swab, and you can upload the file to other DNA comparison websites. I'll go through the sites that are available later on, um, and I suggest that you use all of them. I was helping an adoptee a couple of years ago. She was a Mrs. Murphy, and she was in all bar one of the big DNA websites. And the DNA match that she really needed to solve who her parents were was in the one she wasn't in. So I call that Murphy's Law. <laughs> if there are N DNA websites, your most critical, and you're in N minus one of them, your most critical match will be in the nth website. So where does our DNA come from? We all start off as a sperm fertilizing an egg. And there are two types of sperm. Half of them have a Y chromosome and result in a male offspring. Half of them have an X chromosome and result in a female offspring. And the sperm also has 22 what we call autosomal chromosomes. The egg also has 22 autosomal chromosomes and they line up in pairs. That's where the pairs of letters that we saw a minute ago come from. The egg also contains an X chromosome. If you're a female, you end up with two X chromosomes, one from your father, one from your mother. If you're a male, you end up with one Y chromosome from your father and one X chromosome from your mother. And the egg also contains something called the mitochondria. So everybody has mitochondria, which comes from the mother. So each of these have different inheritance paths. And this table here is my summary. You can read the details above in your own time. Only males have a Y chromosome. It comes from the father only. So the Y chromosome follows the same path as the surname typically follows. So if you're interested in surname studies, the Y chromosome is a huge help to you. If you're female and you're interested in surname studies, if you're interested in your birth surname, find a brother, an uncle, a father, a male with your birth surname, and get his DNA and get his Y chromosome analyzed. If you're a married woman and you're interested in your married surname, then get your husband's or your son's or your father-in-law's or somebody from your husband's side of the family to provide the Y chromosome DNA. 
We all have 22 pairs of autosomal chromosomes. We get them equally from both parents. On average, a quarter of our autosomal DNA comes from each grandparent. It might not be exactly a quarter. You might have 30% from your paternal grandfather and 20% from your paternal grandmother, but the two bits on the paternal side have to add up to 50. So on average, an eighth comes from each great-grandfather, a sixteenth from an eighth from each great-grandparent, a sixteenth from each great-great-grandparent, and so on. And those proportions get very small as you go back through the generations. So you will certainly match anyone closer than a third cousin when you compare autosomal DNA. Third cousins about 90% of the time share some of their autosomal DNA from their shared great-great-grandparents. Fourth cousins about half the time will share autosomal DNA. Fifth cousins maybe only about 10% of the time will share autosomal DNA. We have an awful lot of fifth cousins. The X chromosomes follow more convoluted uh, inheritance paths. The best way to look at them is with this chart. I think um, the colored segments on that fan chart represent the ancestors from whom part of the X chromosome could be inherited. Um, so here in the middle, you have a female who has two X chromosomes, one from her father, one from her mother. The one from the father came to him from his mother who had two, one from each of her parents, and her father had one from his parent, and so on. The bottom line is that your X DNA can come to you through any path that doesn't go through two consecutive males. And the last bit is the mitochondrial DNA. Everybody gets it from their mother, and everybody has it. So if I bring up my pedigree chart again, just to summarize, my Y chromosome and my Waldron surname came from my father, who came from his father, who came from his father, who came from, got it from his father, all back along the Waldron male line. My mitochondrial DNA came from my mother, who was a Durkin, who got it from her mother, who by coincidence was a Durkin married to a Durkin, who got it from her mother, who was an O'Neill, who got it from her mother, whose maiden surname I still don't know after many decades of trying to find it out. So the problem from genealogy with mitochondrial DNA is the surname changes with every generation. So that's the, the lineage that's possibly the hardest to, to trace. And the autosomal DNA, which is the most commonly used, comes 50% from each parent, 25% from each grandparent, 12.5% from each great grandparent on average, six and a quarter percent from each great great grandparent. Sorry, that wasn't meant to come up. That was the one that was meant to come up. So I'm going to say a little bit about Y DNA and then we'll go back to autosomal DNA. And this is the beginner's class, so I won't say any more about mitochondrial or X DNA. Um, if our DNA passed unchanged from parent to child, we'd all be identical and it wouldn't be of any use to us. What makes it useful is the occasional random changes from parent to child. So sometimes we have a simple mutation where the letters are being transcribed from the parent to child and an A changes to a C or something like that. And sometimes we have something a little more complicated, what's called a short tandem repeat where you have maybe a long string like this with the letters C, C, T, G repeated seven times. In the parent, it might be repeated only six times or eight times in the child. A mutation might insert or remove one of those little blocks of C, C, T, Gs. So we call that an STR, the simple mutation where one letter changes, say, from an A to a C is called a single nucleotide polymorphism. Again, you don't need to know the big words. It's just an SNP. So two types of mutation, STR and SNP. And the STR was the one that was originally used about 20 years ago for genetic genealogy and surname studies. Um, and in the very early days, people used to just look at 12 markers on the Y chromosome. Now the surname projects are looking at 111 markers. So this is the Durkin surname project. As you saw, my mother was a Durkin. Uh, these are all the men who have signed up for this project. You see their kit number in the first column, their present surname in the second column, their most distant known patrilineal ancestor in the third column, where you get 50 characters to fill in names, dates, and places to try and identify them uniquely. 
So you see some people end up with double barrel names, some people have a surname DNA switch that they know about, some people may have a surname DNA switch that they don't know about. The haplogroup column here is based on the SNP mutations, the other columns here are the STR mutations. So you see for the first STR marker, practically all the Durkins have a 13, one of them has a 14. For the next few markers, they're all the same. Then you have two branches of Durkins in this marker, um, one group with 17s, one group with 18s, and one stray with a 19. There's another group over here with 29s and 30s. And you see that the 29s are all in people who have 18s in this one. So you can build what they call a mutation history tree uh, by trying to work out where in the Durkin family tree these mutations occurred. If you go down to the bottom then, there are people with other surnames who are in the project because they have a, a Durkin female somewhere in their ancestry. And you see lots of color here. The differences from the mode are highlighted in color. There's very few colored squares in the Durkin part. There's a lot when you're comparing unrelated people. Um, now they're looking at up to 700 of those markers where 20 years ago they thought looking at 12 was breakthrough. And they count the number of differences, that's called the genetic distance. The closer two men are genealogically in theory, the smaller the genetic distance between them. So there might be zero differences out of 12 or nine differences out of 111. So the correlation is not perfect between the genetic distance and the relationship. When a mutation happens, there's a genetic distance of say one out of 37 between the father and the son, where the son has a mutation that makes him different from the father. Then there might be another mutation for seven or 10 generations. So in that case, you will have a great-great-great-great-grandfather and a great-great-great-great-grandson with zero genetic distance between them. But there's a correlation and it's certainly worth looking at. And you can build up mankind into a Y-DNA haplotree, as it's called. It's now a very big thing. It takes ages to load. So while that's loading, I'll, oops, I'll go back and show you the previous version. I should be sitting down to do this. I hit the wrong buttons when I'm standing up. Um, this is what the haplotree looked like about 20 years ago. They didn't even need all the letters of the alphabet to represent all the different Y chromosomes that had been identified. It only went up to haplogroup or it goes back to a man that they call the Y Adam the only man who was alive at his time who has male line descendants living today. Not the only man alive at his time because as I'm sure you've discovered in your research, surnames die out, male lines die out, surnames get daughtered out. Um, so there were other men around about 180,000 years ago or something they think he lived. And then his descendants through STR mutations split into branch A and another branch which split into another branch and so on until we had about 20 branches. Now Family Tree DNA has this public version of the haplotree. It has 20,000 branches, a thousand times the number of branches there were 20 years ago, and hundreds of thousands of variants. Most Irish men belong to the Orr branch, and there are 13,812 customers in that branch. Most of them have this M173 mutation. These are SNP mutations we're looking at now. We've come on 20 years from the STR mutations. Each SNP mutation gets an identifier with a letter or multiple letters and numbers. And eventually, if we open up the branches, most people in Ireland and in Northwestern Europe are in these OR branches. And if you send off your DNA for the basic Y37 analysis, which costs $119, if you're an Irishman, there's an 80% chance it will come back and tell you you're in this M269 branch which covers most Irish men. Um, and now we're overlaying the surnames and the mutations on the same family tree. This is a website called The Big Tree. It's specific to haplogroup or the pr predominant Irish male haplogroup. And you can see various surname clusters here. Under the DC189 uh, SNP mutation, 
you have five out of seven McNamaras. So all these mutations over here probably occurred in men who were already called McNamara. And they're closely related to some of the O'Neills and McInerneys and Slatteries. And over here you have a branch of Corries and Curries. All these mutations probably originally happened in a man already called Corrie. And here's an O'Malley group. So you can actually say somebody with this mutation is almost certainly genetically a Corrie or an O'Malley or a McNamara. And that is cutting edge state of the art research really today. So we go back now to the autosomal DNA. Men and women can do this. Um, every sperm and egg is potentially unique. So suppose this is my paternal DNA and this is my maternal DNA. Every sperm created in my body takes a string from my father's side and then a string in red from my mother's side and another string in blue from my father's side and another string in red from my mother's side. So that's how my offspring, if I had any, would end up with only half of my DNA, half of my paternal and half of my maternal pasted together bit by bit like this. I've done that in a stylized fashion with a switch over about every 25 characters. In practice, it only happens about every 19,000 characters. And these are called crossover points for the color switches, where it switches from paternal side to maternal side. Um, so we end up using the, a unit called the centimorgan to measure the strings of letters which are the same for two relatives. And the centimorgan scale runs from zero up to about 3,600. Um, there's a chart that was put together using experimental data showing that your child will share anything between 3,300 and 3,700 centimorgans with you. It shouldn't really vary. It varies because of different conventions that the companies use and whether they include the X chromosome or not. Your siblings can share anything between 2,200 and 3,300. Some of these are outliers. 2,600 is the average. Your half first cousin on average will share 457 with you. Your third cousin, uh, I can find the third cousin is over on this side, isn't it? On average will share 74. For fourth and fifth cousins, the averages get very small. Um, so you're looking for people with 100 or more centimorgans shared with you, and you should be able to work out the relationship with them. Below 100, it's going to be difficult. I'll come back to that if we have time in the case study. So I said there are lots of websites. Here's a little table I put together, updated today, uh, comparing the six major autosomal DNA comparison websites. Jetmatch.com doesn't run a laboratory, but it takes those big data files from any of the other laboratories and puts them into its comparison database. Family Tree DNA has a laboratory and it works together with MyHeritage. They have the same laboratory, but they have different websites. Ancestry has a laboratory. 23andMe is mostly interested in health inferences. Living DNA is a UK company associated, I think, with Find My Past, which is just getting off the ground. I checked my match list today. I still have only one uh, match on Living DNA, who's my first cousin, who I uploaded myself. Um, <laughs> You can upload your DNA to everything except Ancestry or 23andMe. So if you want to be in all six databases, spit for Ancestry, spit for 23andMe, download the data files from those two, and upload them to the other websites. Um, in theory, most of them allow you to upload your family tree, or at least Jetmatch, Ancestry, and MyHeritage do. At the moment, the family tree DNA one seems to be broken, but they're working on fixing it. Um, family tree downloads are possible at last from family tree DNA. It wasn't possible until recently. The costs vary. Jetmatch you can use for free. If you want to use the advanced services, you pay a $10 a month subscription. Most of these are sale prices because St. Patrick's Day is coming up. Family tree DNA costs you $59, and that's it forevermore. 
ancestry and my heritage currently cost you $59 or 59 euros, but to get the full value out of it, you have to have an annual subscription. So in that way, they're more expensive. 23andMe doesn't seem to have a Patrick's Day sale. It's 99 euro. Living DNA with a small database, you can get into it for only 49 euros as far as I can see. If you're interested in Y-DNA, Family Tree DNA is the only one that does Y-DNA comparison. 23andMe and Living DNA will give you a haplogroup label like ORM269, but it won't give you a match list. So get into all six databases is my advice. Um, and as well as uploading your DNA data, upload your pedigree chart, something like that. I've got various examples there. Um, and they will, the different websites will compare not only your DNA data, but also your pedigree charts and try and give you hints as to how you might be related to your DNA matches. Uh, we'll start with JetMatch. There's a link there to the registration form. If I log in here, we see the main menu. The things on the right hand side are everything it does for you. You can look up other users. Here are the links to upload your data file. I'll give you a link at the end of the class to the detailed instructions. Here is the link to the one-to-many DNA comparison results page. So I'll just put in my own and show you my own matches. Um, you get your top 3,000 matches, so matches drop off the end of the list as new ones arrive. So I know my relationship to most of these, first cousin, first cousin, first cousin, first cousin, half second cousin once removed, half first cousin once removed, second cousin, adoptee who has found her birth parents, but I still haven't figured out how I'm related to her, third cousin once removed, I think, third cousin, fourth cousin, third cousin, don't know, that's the first one, the don't know, fourth cousin, don't know, fourth cousin, don't know. So down to about the 50s, I've worked out the relationships. Below that, it gets difficult to work them out. And as you get down to the end of the 3,000, it gets very difficult. On JetMatch, everyone gets a kit number, and you can compare any two kit numbers and see if they share even tiny bits of DNA. That's the one-to-one -one comparison. If your upload doesn't work, you might need to check the diagnostic utility to see what's gone wrong. You can look at the, the shared matches between two kits. You can check whether your parents shared DNA and passed on that shared DNA to you. Then you have the tier one uh, tools down here. You have to pay $10 a month to use those. The ones I like are the segment search and the Lazarus one. Um, and you can upload your family tree down here and you can search the family trees that other people have uploaded. So lots of things you can do on GEDmatch. Uh, family tree DNA. I'm going to have to log into as well. So that, no, it remembers that I was logged in before I came in here this evening. Um, and it gives you that wonderful graphic for about six seconds. And then uh, it has a similar match list, slightly different features. It also, if you give it enough family tree information, works out which of your matches are paternal related to you through your father, which of your matches are maternal, which of your matches are related to you on both sides. My top match here, it says, is either my father or my son, and says is related to me on both sides, which my father shouldn't be. In fact, it's my identical twin because I uploaded my data file from Ancestry DNA just to make sure uh, or to see how different it was from the file from Family Tree DNA. I've told it that the next few matches are my first cousins. It has worked out for this last one that only uploaded last year. Um, that she's on my father's side, the red means on my mother's side, the blue means on my father's side. And over here is a list of the ancestral surnames, which when you upload your family tree in JEDCOM format are automatically extracted. In theory, that hasn't been working recently either, so it highlights in bold the surnames that we have in common with each other. So naturally, because these are close relatives, we have lots of surnames in common with each other tells you an estimated relationship, the date matched, the amount of DNA shared, and the longest single block of DNA shared. So with myself, the longest block is 267 because that's the length of chromosome number one. 
um, which is the longest of the chromosomes. And there's a link that will bring you straight to your raw data file if you want to download it. Ancestry DNA is the most popular one, as you've seen, with 16 million people. There's my test details. On this settings page, you can link the family tree to the DNA. Make sure you link the right person's family tree to the DNA. Um, display preferences, sharing preferences is very handy if you want to share your match list with somebody else. You just click change there and you scroll down to the bottom. I've shared mine with lots of people and you just add a person, put in the other person's email address, say whether you want them to view or be a collaborator, send them an invitation. And at the very bottom is the link to download your data file for use on the other sites. Um, here's my Ancestry DNA match list. It's filterable by all these fields. You can search by the match's name, by the surname and the match's tree, by birth locations, as long as the birth location is in the database. If I start typing something like Dunbeg, and I wait a moment, it'll pop up, and you have to select it from a drop-down menu. Um, and again, it gives you the name of the match, how much DNA you share, an estimated relationship. It gives you these very annoying headers up here. First cousin header does not mean, in this case, he is my first cousin. Second cousin does not mean second cousin. The first two are my second cousin. The next one is my second cousin once removed. It doesn't have a separate bucket for second cousin once removed. And anyway, you can't tell from the DNA the difference between a second cousin and a second cousin once removed. And sometimes these search fields, when your kit is newly uploaded, don't seem to work. But if you wait a few days, they tend to work better. And for each match, you have a match page. Um, so there's my match with my adopted relative. Uh, from her perspective, she sees my family tree. And here we can see a list of the matches that we both share and how much DNA I share with that match. My Heritage does the match page much better. Um, here is my search match. You're not supposed to show information about living people, so I said I pick my fourth cousin who sadly died a few months ago um, and you see the surnames in her tree the scrolling down doesn't work properly you see maps with dots for where common ancestors might have lived and then you see the shared matches but now you actually see how much the shared match shares with me and with my late cousin Deborah so again there's two copies of me and my heritage and it's because I'm fully identical to myself on both sides that adds up the paternal and maternal comes to 7,000. Here's my first cousin, shares 900 with me, shares 34% with our fourth cousin. These are ranked by the sum of the DNA shared by the shared match with both of us. The next one is quite distant, I don't know who she is, but the nice thing over here is it says if we share exactly the same DNA segment. So if three people share a single segment of DNA, all three must have a common ancestor from whom they inherited that. The third person down here, it's not triangulated. It could be that I'm related to her on one side and Deborah is related to her on the other side. Um, and that it's just coincidence that we're both related to her, that all three don't have a single common ancestor. A uh, few more rules. Make sure you reveal your surname because you get the opportunity to do so. And make sure it's your birth surname. If you're Mrs. Smith, you don't want every Smith in the world saying, I'm a Smith too, I might be related to you, especially if your own maiden surname is very rare. Uh, reveal the gender. Don't go sending off a Y-DNA sample and saying it comes from Mrs. Smith, because people won't know whether it's Mrs. Smith's father's DNA or her husband's DNA or her son's DNA or whose DNA it is. Um, you don't need to provide anything else other than the gender and the surname. If you want to pr maintain privacy, uh, that's all you need to give away. Try not to use pseudonyms. You won't attract the attention of people with the same surname. You're less likely to be contacted. And you may end up with a lot of correspondence or a little correspondence, depending on how active you are and how many websites you're on. Keep it somewhere you can search it all. So I'm going to take five minutes to fly through the Lynch story. The Lynch's 
were from the same townland as my grandmother on the Luped Peninsula, Moveen West up here. Here's the Shannon flowing into the Atlantic with Clare on the north, Kerry on the south. And I knew about the Lynch neighbours. Uh, they survived the famine. Here's the Illustrated London News sketches of the famine, which you have seen in every book on Irish history, including the village of Moveen, when the Lynches lived there, when almost every house had been unroofed in evictions. Um, so there were two brothers who lived across the road from each other. Here's the Griffiths valuation map. We had Mary Lynch, who was a widow, presumably, because she's, her husband would be the occupier in Griffith if he was alive and her son Patrick Lynch here across the road from her, and another Lynch, we're not sure how he's related over here. The story was that the Lynch farm was originally an OD farm. I knew that from oral history, and there were two sisters in that house, one married Lynch, one married O'Connell. The farm was divided. By 1855, the O'Connells were down at the other end of the townland in the bog. They'd probably been evicted, we think. Um, and then there was third brother went to Connecticut and his death certificate enabled us to confirm the parents which we would never have found out in Irish records which don't survive. Here's Daniel Lynch down the bottom died in Newtown Connecticut on August the 4th age 62 married born in County Clare Ireland and it's badly digitized you have to go down to the third last line of the next page to see he died from paralysis, he was a farmer, and his parents were Michael Lynch and Mary O'D. Michael Lynch's name is gone because he's dead before Griffith's valuation and the parish records haven't survived. We knew from the oral tradition that Mary was an O'D from Griffith's valuation, we knew her first name. Um, so a relative from Connecticut sent money to the Clare Roots project. All these family tree DNA projects have a fund where people can make donations, which can only be spent on DNA testing to go towards the test cost for a descendant of the Moveen West Lynch families. Um, so I found him a fourth cousin and I persuaded her to swab and he paid for it. And we waited for her results. Meanwhile, we get this message from California uh, from Eileen Lynch, who said, our grandfather Eugene Lynch is such a mystery to us, we really don't know how to find him. All we have for certain is the 1910 census. It says he came over in 1887. The story is this, Eugene married my grandmother in 1904. He abandoned her and their children in 1909, she thought. In fact, he's on that 1910 census return. The last child was born five days after the census enumerator called. We don't know whether the mother was so ashamed that she'd been deserted, that she put the father's name down on the census return thinking he'd come back, or whether the dates just got muddled up. But anyway, the baby never knew his father. He went sometime around the time of the census. And all she knew was he was born in Ireland. That's all it said on the census. Claire then is the lady whose DNA was paid for through the Claire Roots project. Ed is her fourth cousin. Claire's mother was a Lynch. Ed's mother was an O'Connell. They were descended from the two sisters who divided the farm between them back in the 1820s. And they shared this huge DNA segment for fourth cousins, 50 centimorgans. Um, and they also shared a bit in the middle from 17 million to 38 million, 27 centimorgans with Eugene's grandson, Michael from California. So now we know because Claire and Ed have got this DNA segment from their OD, great, great, great grandfather, that Michael must also be related to Claire's OD ancestors. But we know Michael is a Lynch, and we know that the ODs had a daughter, Mary, who married a Lynch. So we can be pretty sure that Michael and his grandfather, Eugene, are descended from the Lynch OD couple. So we can tell the people in California, we have worked out not only what county, not only what parish, not only what townland, but what house in Ireland Eugene's family came from. And they were on the, almost on the next plane over to visit the ancestral home in Clare. Um, so time is rapidly running out and I will skip ahead to when they came back again. I showed you the Watto chart at the beginning for this family with the different possibilities, where might Eugene fit into the family tree? Um, 
and we couldn't find a match. We swabbed various descendants of the four Lynch brothers and the matches were good but not close enough and we said there must be a fifth brother we can't find. Then I had this flash of inspiration one day. What if Eugene Lynch took his mother's surname? He would still share all that Lynch and OD DNA through his mother. I went looking in workhouse records and parish records for a single mother called Lynch. I didn't find one. Then I said, let's look at the Y DNA results. Here's Michael Lynch's Y111 matches. There isn't a single Lynch to be seen. There's a James, an O'Malley, a Curry, another Curry, a Malvi, a Jones, a Slaughter, more O'Malley's. So a handful of surnames. Two of them are Curry. Then I looked at the 67 marker matches. Here's another Corey who's only got 67 markers, so he wouldn't show up in the 111 match. Here's a Curry with 67 markers. Here's another Curry who's only done 67. And the one I blocked out completely is an adoptee. And when we got back to the adoptee, he said, I've recently discovered who my father was. He was a Curry. So maybe Michael isn't a Lynch at all. Maybe he's a Curry. Maybe Eugene wasn't a Lynch at all. Maybe Eugene was a Curry or an O'Curry or a Eugene O'Curry. Does the name Eugene O'Curry ring bells with anyone? No? Famous historian of the 19th century involved in the Ordnance Survey wrote the Ordnance Survey letters, which you can read online on Irish place names. One of the first professors in the Catholic University in Dublin when it was set up in the 1850s from West Clare um, with ancestors from the same townland as Mary Lynch and her husband, Thomas Curry, who had a son called Eugene probably called after his famous relative, the professor in Dublin. And the DNA matches fit with Eugene Curry. So is it possible that the subject of this query, which I had saved way back in 2004, when Professor Eugene O'Curry's work was republished, um, this comes from a great granddaughter of Eugene Curry of Lislanahan County Clare, but five miles from Moveen. She says, I know he's not the author, Professor Curry. He's much younger. Um, she has his school notebook. She has his photograph. He was well educated. He married a neighbor called Ellen Kelly. This ancestor has been very elusive. Eugene Curry uh, went to New York. He married his neighbor. We found his wife in the census in 1900 in New York in Brooklyn. Um, Line number, is she on line 48? Uh, at the bottom, if that copyright message will go away. Um, Curry, Ellen, servant in a household with a German family. Um, married for six years, two children born alive, two still living, born in Ireland, migrated in 1889. We found the two children, one living with an aunt in Brooklyn, one living with an uncle in Connecticut. And the family lore, which we got from the descendants of Eugene Curry, went west to find his fame and fortune and would send for his family at a later date. He was never heard from again. We had been wondering why two people who seemed to be third cousins once removed shared 209 centimorgans of DNA, way more than you would expect. If Eugene Curry became Eugene Lynch, that third cousin once removed relationship would be second cousin once removed, the DNA would make sense. And over the course of days and weeks and months, we're now absolutely certain this runaway from New York who abandoned his family, changed his surname from his father's surname to his mother's surname, had another family in California, did the same thing again, might have done it a third time, he still got away with it if he did it a third time, but after 119 years, DNA has finally identified him. So that is the sort of mystery that you can solve uh, with a combination of all sorts of DNA analysis. So there's a reading list at the end. Probably the most important is the first thing, how to get the most out of your DNA results, the detailed instructions on copying your DNA data file from one website to another. I well over time, so we'll leave it at that. Any questions? No?
Anyone persuaded to swab? The only question is, what happened to your swabs? What happened to your swabs? For posterity. Your data file is preserved for posterity. Family tree DNA is the only one which guarantees to keep them in storage for 25 years so that if the technology improves, they can be run through the new DNA analysis machines. <laughs>